Chapter 3 First Impressions M, the Pole who had been talking to me, had scarcely gone out when Gazin rolled into the kitchen, hopelessly drunk. This convict, drunk in broad daylight, on a working day when all were bound to be out at work, under the rule of a stern officer who might come into the prison at any moment, under the control of the sergeant who never left the prison, with guards and sentries about. In short, in the midst of severity and discipline, threw into confusion all the ideas I had begun to form of prison life. And it was a long time before I could explain to myself all the facts which were so puzzling to me during my early days in prison. I have mentioned already that the convicts always had private work of their own, and that such work was a natural craving in prison life. That, apart from this craving, the prisoner is passionately fond of money, and prizes it above everything, almost as much as freedom, and that he is comforted if he has it jingling in his pocket. On the other hand, he becomes dejected, sad, uneasy, and out of spirits when he has none, and then he is ready to steal or do anything to get it. But though money was so precious in prison, it never stayed long with the lucky man who had it. To begin with, it was difficult to keep it from being stolen or taken away. If the major discovered it in the course of a sudden search, he promptly confiscated it. Possibly he spent it on improving the prison fare. Anyway, it was taken to him. But much more frequently it was stolen. There was no one who could be relied upon. Later on we discovered a way of keeping money quite securely. It was put into the keeping of an old believer who came to us from the Starodubovsky settlements. He was a little gray-headed man of sixty. He made a vivid impression on me from the first minute. He was so unlike the other convicts, there was something so calm and gentle in his expression that I remember I looked with a peculiar pleasure at his serene, candid eyes, which were surrounded with tiny wrinkles like rays. I often talked to him, and I have rarely met a more kindly, warm-hearted creature in my life. He had been sent there for a very serious offense. Among the Starodubovsky old believers, some converts to the Orthodox Church were made. The government gave them great encouragement and began to make great efforts for the conversion of the others. The old man resolved with other fanatics to stand up for the faith, as he expressed it. An Orthodox church was being built, and they burnt it down. As one of the instigators, the old man was sent to penal servitude. He had been a well-to-do tradesman and left a wife and children behind him, but he went with a brave heart into exile, for in his blindness he considered it martyrdom for the faith. After spending some time with him, one could not help asking oneself how this meek old man, as gentle as a child, could have been a rebel. Several times I talked to him of the faith. He would never yield an inch in his convictions, but there was no trace of anger or of hatred in his replies. And yet he had destroyed a church and did not deny doing it. It seemed that from his convictions he must have considered his action and his suffering for it a glorious achievement. But however closely I watched him and studied him, I never detected the faintest sign of pride or vanity in him. There were other old believers in the prison, mostly Siberians. They were very well-educated people, shrewd peasants, great students of the Bible who quibbled over every letter, and great dialecticians in their own way. They were a crafty, conceited, aggressive, and extremely intolerant set. The old man was absolutely different. Though perhaps better read than they, he avoided argument. He was of a very communicative disposition. He was merry, often laughing, not with the coarse cynical laugh of the other convicts, but with a gentle, candid laugh, in which there was a great deal of childlike simplicity that seemed peculiarly in keeping with his gray hair. 
I may be mistaken, but I fancy that one can know a man from his laugh. And if you like a man's laugh before you know anything of him, you may confidently say that he is a good man. Though the old man had gained the respect of all throughout the prison, he was not in the least conceited about it. The convicts used to call him Grandfather, and they never insulted him. I could partly imagine the sort of influence he must have had on his fellow believers. But in spite of the unmistakable courage with which he endured his punishment, there was also a deep inconsolable melancholy in his heart, which he tried to conceal from all. I lived in the same room with him. One night I woke up at three o'clock and heard the sound of quiet, restrained weeping. The old man was sitting on the stove, the same stove on which the Bible reader who threw the brick at the major used to pray at night. He was saying his prayers over his manuscript book. He was weeping, and I could hear him saying from time to time, Lord, do not forsake me. Lord, give me strength. My little ones, my darling little ones, I shall never see you again. I can't describe how sad it made me. It was to this old man that almost all the convicts began by degrees to give their money for him to take care of it. Almost all the prisoners were thieves, but suddenly for some reason the belief gained ground that the old man could not steal. They knew that he hid the money given into his keeping in some place so secret that no one could find it. In the end, he explained his secret to me in some of the poles. On one of the posts of the fence there was a twig apparently adhering firmly on the trunk. But it could be taken out, and there was a deep hollow in the wood. Here, Grandfather used to hide the money, and then insert the twig again so that no one could ever find anything. But I am wandering from my story. I was just saying why money never stayed long in a convict's pocket. Apart from the difficulty of keeping it, life in prison was so dreary, a convict is a creature by nature so eager for freedom, and from his social position so careless and reckless, that to have his fling for all he is worth, to spend all his fortune carousing with noise and music, and so to forget his depression, if only for the moment, naturally attracts him. It was strange to see how some of them would work unceasingly, sometimes for several months, simply to spend all their earnings in one day, leaving nothing, and then to drudge away for months again till the next outbreak. Many of them were very fond of getting new clothes, which were never of the regulation pattern. Black trousers unlike the uniform, tunics, coats, Cotton shirts and belts studded with metal discs were also in great demand. They dressed up on holidays, and then always paraded through all the prison wards to show themselves to all the world. Their pleasure in fine clothes was quite childish, and in many things the convicts were perfect children. It is true that all these fine things soon vanished from the owner's possession, Sometimes they pawned or sold them for next to nothing the same evening. The outbreak of drinking developed gradually, however. It was put off as a rule till a holiday or till a name day. On his name day, the convict set a candle before the icon and said his prayers as soon as he got up. Then he dressed in his best and ordered a dinner. He bought beef and fish. Siberian patties were made. He would eat like an ox, almost always alone, rarely inviting his comrades to share his meal. Then vodka was brought out. The hero of the day would get drunk as a lord and always walked all over the prison, reeling and staggering, trying to show to everyone that he was drunk, that he was jolly and so deserving of general respect. Everywhere among the Russian people a certain sympathy is felt for a drunken man, in prison he was positively treated with respect. There were certain aristocratic customs connected with prison revelry. 
The carousing convict always hired music. There was a little pole in prison, a runaway soldier, a nasty little fellow who played the fiddle and had an instrument, his one possession in the world. He had no sort of trade, and his only way of earning money was by playing lively dances for convicts who were having a spree. His duty was to follow his drunken employer from room to room and to play the fiddle with all his might. Often his face betrayed boredom and dejection. But the shout of, Play on, you're paid to do it, made him go on scraping away. The convict can always feel confident when he begins drinking that, if he gets too drunk, he will certainly be looked after. He will be put in bed in time and hidden away if the authorities turn up, and all this will be quite disinterested. The sergeant and the veteran guards who lived in the prison to keep discipline could have their minds at rest, too. The drunken convict could not create any disorder. All the prisoners in the room looked after him, and if he were noisy or unmanageable, they would quickly restrain him and even tie him up. And so the inferior prison officials winked at drunkenness and were unwilling to notice it. They knew very well that if vodka were not allowed, it would make things worse. But how was vodka obtained? It was bought in the prison itself from the so-called publicans. There were several of them, and they carried on their trade successfully and unintermittently, though the number of those who drank and made merry was small, for merrymaking costs money, and the convict's money is hardly earned. The publican's operations were begun, managed, and carried on in a very original way. Suppose the convict knows no trade and is not willing to exert himself. There were men like this, but is keen on getting money and of an impatient disposition, in a hurry to make his pile. If he has a little money to start with, he makes up his mind to trade in vodka. It's a bold and risky enterprise involving considerable danger. He may have to pay for it with a flogging, and lose his stock and his capital all at once. But the publican takes the risk. He begins with a small sum, and so at first he smuggles the vodka into the prison himself, and, of course, disposes of it to great advantage. He repeats the experiment a second and a third time, and if he does not get caught, he quickly sells his stock and only then builds up a real trade on a large scale. He becomes an entrepreneur, a capitalist, employs agents and assistants, runs far less risk and makes more and more money. His subordinates risk themselves for him. There are always in the prison lots of men who have wasted all they have on cards or drink, wretched, ragged creatures who have no trade but have a certain pluck and daring. The only asset such a man has left is his back. It may still be of some use to him, and so the spendthrift profligate decides to turn it to profit. He goes to the publican and offers his services for smuggling vodka. A well-to-do publican has several such working for him. Somewhere outside the prison there is some person, a soldier, a workman, sometimes even a woman, who, for a comparatively large commission, buys vodka at a tavern with the publican's money and conceals it in some out-of-the-way place where the convicts go to work. Almost always the intermediary tests the quality of the vodka to begin with, and ruthlessly fills up the measure with water. The publican may take it or leave it. A convict is not in a position to make his own terms. He must be thankful that he has got the vodka, however poor the quality, and has not lost his money altogether. The publican introduces his agents to the intermediary beforehand, and then they go to the latter carrying with them the guts of a bullock, which have been washed and then filled with water to keep them supple and fit to hold vodka. When he has filled the guts with vodka, the convict winds them round himself where they will be least conspicuous. I need not say that this calls forth all the ingenuity, all the thievish cunning of the smuggler. 
His honor is to some extent involved. He has to deceive both the guards and the sentries. He does deceive them. The guard, often a raw recruit, is never a match for a clever thief. Of course, the guard is the subject of special study beforehand. Besides, the time and place where he is working is all carefully considered, too, by the smuggler. The convict may be building a stove. He climbs onto the stove. Who can tell what he is doing there? A guard cannot be expected to climb after him. On his way to the prison, he takes some money in his hand, fifteen or twenty silver kopecks in case of need, and waits for the corporal at the gate. The corporal examines every convict returning from work and feels him over before opening the prison door to him. The man smuggling in vodka usually reckons on the corporal's scrupling to handle him too minutely in some parts. But sometimes the wily corporal does not stand on ceremony and discovers the vodka. Then there is only one thing left to do. The smuggler, unseen by the guard, silently slips into the corporal's hand the coin he has been keeping concealed in his own. It sometimes happens that, thanks to this maneuver, he gets successfully into the prison with the vodka. But sometimes this method does not answer and then he has to pay with his last asset, his back. It is reported to the major, the asset is flogged, and cruelly flogged. The vodka is confiscated, and the agent takes it all on himself without giving away his employer. And, be it noted, not because he scorns to tell tales, but simply because it does not pay him to do so. He would be flogged anyway. His only consolation would be that the other man would be flogged too. But he will need his employer again, though in accordance with custom and previous agreement, the smuggler gets nothing from his employer to compensate him for the flogging. As for telling tales in general, it is very common. In prison, the man who turns traitor is not exposed to humiliation. Indignation against him is unthinkable. He is not shunned. The others make friends with him. In fact, if you were to try and point out the loathsomeness of treachery, you would not be understood. The convict with whom I had broken off all relations, a mean and depraved creature who had been a gentleman, was friendly with the major's orderly, Fedka, and served him as a spy, while the latter reported all he heard about the convicts to the major. Every one of us knew this, Yet no one ever dreamed of punishing the scoundrel or even reproaching him for it. But I am wandering from my subject. It happens, of course, that vodka is smuggled in successfully. Then the publican takes the guts, pays for them, and begins to count the cost. It turns out, when he reckons it, that the stuff has cost him a great deal— and so to increase his profit, he dilutes the vodka once more, adding an almost equal bulk of water. Then he is ready for his customers. On the first holiday, sometimes even on a working day, the customer turns up. This is a convict who has been working like an ox for some months and has saved up his money in order to spend it all on drink on some day fixed beforehand. Long before it arrives, this day has been the object of the poor toiler's dreams at night, and happy daydreams over his work, and its fascination has kept up his spirits through the weary routine of prison life. At last the happy day dawns in the east. His money has been saved, not taken away, not stolen, and he brings it to the publican. To begin with, the latter gives him the vodka as pure as possible, that is, only twice diluted. But as the bottle gets emptier, he invariably fills it up again with water. A cup of vodka costs five or six times as much as in a tavern. You can imagine how many cups of such vodka must be drunk, and what they will have cost before the point of intoxication is reached. But from having lost the habit of drinking, and having abstained from it so long, the convict readily gets drunk, and he usually goes on drinking till he has spent all his money. 
Then he brings out all his new clothes. The publican is a pawnbroker as well. He first gets hold of the newly acquired personal possessions, then the old things, and finally the prison clothes. When he has drunk up everything to the last rag, the drunken convict lies down to sleep, and next day, waking up with the inevitable splitting headache, he vainly entreats the publican to give him just a sip of vodka as a pick-me-up. Mournfully he endures his sad plight, and the same day sets to work again, and works again for several months unceasingly, dreaming of the happy day of debauch lost and gone forever, and by degrees beginning to take heart again and look forward to another similar day, still far away, but sure to come some time in its turn. As for the publican, after making a huge sum of money, some dozens of rubles, he gets the vodka ready for the last time, adding no water to it, for he means it for himself. He has done enough of trading. It is time for him to enjoy himself, too. Then begins an orgy of drinking, eating, and music. With such means at his disposal, he even softens the hearts of the inferior prison officials. The debauch sometimes lasts several days. All the vodka he has prepared is soon drunk, of course. Then the prodigal resorts to the other publicans who are on the lookout for him, and drinks until he has spent every farthing. However carefully the convicts guard their drunken fellow, he is sometimes seen by a higher official, by the major or the officer on duty. He is taken to the guardhouse, stripped of his money if he has it on him, and finally flogged. He shakes himself, goes back into the prison, and a few days later takes up his trade in vodka again. Some of the festive characters, the rich ones, of course, have dreams of the fair sex, too. For a big bribe to the guard escorting them, they can sometimes be taken in secret to some place in town instead of to work. There, in some out-of-the-way little house at the furthest end of the town, there is a feast on a huge scale, and really large sums of money are squandered. Even a convict is not despised if he has money. A guard is picked out beforehand who knows his way about. Such guards are usually future candidates for prison themselves. But anything can be done for money, and such expeditions almost always remain a secret. I must add that they are a very rare occurrence. So much money is needed, and devotees of the fair sex have recourse to other methods which are quite free from danger. Before I had been many days in prison, my curiosity was particularly aroused by a young convict, a very pretty lad. He was called Sorotkin. He was rather an enigmatic creature in many ways. What struck me, first of all, was his beautiful face. He was not more than three and twenty. He was in the special division, that is, of criminals with a life sentence, which means that he was considered one of the worst of the military convicts. Mild and gentle, he talked little and rarely laughed. He had blue eyes, regular features, a clear-skinned, delicate face, and fair hair. He was such a pretty fellow that even his half-shaven head hardly disfigured him. He knew no sort of trade, but he often had money, though not much at a time. One could see that he was lazy, and he was untidy in his dress. But occasionally someone would give him something nice to wear, even sometimes a red shirt, and Sorotkin was obviously pleased at his new clothes and walked about the prison to show himself. He did not drink nor play cards and hardly ever quarreled with anyone. He used to walk behind the prison with his hands in his pockets, quiet and dreamy. What he could be dreaming about, it was difficult to guess. If one called to him sometimes from curiosity, asked him some question, he answered at once and even respectfully, not like a convict, 
though always briefly and uncommunicatively, and he looked at one like a child of ten years old. When he had any money he did not buy himself something necessary, did not get his coat mended, did not order new boots, but bought rolls or gingerbread and ate them like a child of seven. Ah, oh, you Sorotkin, the convicts would say to him sometimes, you are an orphan all forlorn. Out of working hours he used to wander about the prison barracks. Almost everyone else would be at work, only he had nothing to do. If anything was said to him, usually a taunt, he and the others in his division were often made fun of, he would turn round and go off to another room without saying a word. Sometimes he blushed crimson if he were much ridiculed. I often wondered how this peaceable, simple-hearted creature had come into prison. Once I was in the convict's ward in the hospital. Sorotkin, too, was ill and was in the bed next to mine. One evening we fell into talk. Somehow he got warmed up and incidentally told me how he had been taken for a soldier, how his mother cried seeing him off, and how wretched he was as a recruit. He added that he could not endure the life of a recruit, because everyone there was so cross and stern, and the officers were almost always displeased with him. "'How did it end?' I asked. "'What brought you here? And in the special division, too? Oh, Sorotkin, Sorotkin! "'Why, I was only a year in the battalion, Alexander Petrovich,' and I came here because I killed my commanding officer. I'd heard it, Sorotkin, but I can't believe it. How could you kill anyone? It happened so, Alexander Petrovitch. I was awfully miserable. But how do the other recruits manage? Of course it's hard at first, but they get used to it, and in the end they become fine soldiers. Your mother must have spoiled you. She fed you on milk and goodies till you were eighteen. My mother was very fond of me, it's true. She took to her bed when I went for a recruit, and I've heard she never got up from it. Life was very bitter to me at last when I was a recruit. The officer did not like me. He was always punishing me. And what for? I gave way to everyone, was punctual in everything did not touch vodka, did not pick up any habits. It's a bad business, you know, Alexander Petrovitch, when one picks up habits. Such cruel-heartedness everywhere, no chance to have a good cry. Sometimes you'd get behind a corner and cry there. Well, I was once on sentry duty. It was at night. I was put as sentry by the gun rack. It was windy, it was autumn and pitch dark. And I felt so sick, so sick. I stood my gun on the ground. I twisted off the bayonet and put it on one side, slipped off my right boot, put the barrel to my breast, leant against it, and with my big toe pulled the trigger. It missed fire. I looked at the gun, cleaned the touch hole, poured some fresh powder into it, struck the flint and put the gun to my breast again. And would you believe it? The powder flashed, but the gun did not go off again. I wondered what was the meaning of it. I took my boot and put it on, fixed on the bayonet and walked to and fro, saying nothing. It was then I made up my mind to do what I did. I did not care where I went if I could get away from there. Half an hour later, the officer rode up. He was making the chief round of inspection. He went straight for me. Is that the way to stand on sentry duty? I took my gun in my hand and stuck the bayonet into him up to the hilt. I've come four thousand miles and I am here with a life sentence. He was not lying. And for what other crime could he have been given a life sentence? Ordinary crimes are punished far more leniently. 
But Sorotkin was the only good-looking one of these lifers. As for the others in the same case, of whom there were about fifteen among us, it was strange to look at them. There were only two or three tolerable faces among them. The others were all such hideous creatures, filthy-looking with long ears. Some of them were grey-headed men. If possible, I will describe all this group more exactly later on. Sorotkin was often friendly with Gazin, the convict whom I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, describing how he staggered into the kitchen drunk, and how he upset my preconceived ideas of prison life. This Gazin was a horrible creature. He made a terrible and painful impression on everyone. It always seemed to me that there could not be a more ferocious monster than he was. I have seen at Tobolsk, Kamenev, a robber famous for his crimes. Later on I saw Sokolov, a runaway soldier who was being tried for terrible murders he had committed. But neither of them made such a repulsive impression on me as Gazin. I sometimes felt as though I were looking at a huge, gigantic spider the size of a man. He was a totter, terribly strong, stronger than anyone in the prison, of more than average height, of Herculean proportions, with a hideous, disproportionately huge head. He walked with a slouch and looked sullenly from under his brows. There were strange rumors about him in the prison. It was known that he had been a soldier, but the convicts said among themselves, I do not know with what truth, that he was an escaped convict from Nurchinsk, that he had been sent more than once to Siberia, and had escaped more than once, had more than once changed his name, and had at last been sent to our prison with a life sentence. It was said, too, that he had been fond of murdering small children simply for pleasure, he would lure the child to some convenient spot, begin by terrifying and tormenting it, and after enjoying to the full the shuddering terror of the poor little victim, he would kill it with a knife slowly, with deliberation and enjoyment. All this perhaps was invented in consequence of the feeling of oppression Gazin aroused in everyone, but all these stories were in keeping with him and harmonized with his appearance. Yet at ordinary times, when he was not drunk, his behavior in prison was very orderly. He was always quiet, did not quarrel with anyone, and avoided quarrels. But, as it seemed, from contempt for the others, as though he considered himself superior to all the rest, he spoke very little and was, as it were, intentionally reserved. All his movements were calm, deliberate, self-confident. One could see from his eyes that he was very intelligent and exceedingly cunning, but there was always something of supercilious derision and cruelty in his face and smile. He traded in vodka and was one of the richest vodka dealers in the prison. But about twice in the year he would get drunk himself, and then all the brutality of his nature came out. As he gradually got drunk, he began at first attacking people with jibes, the most spiteful, calculated, as it seemed, long premeditated taunts. Finally, when he was quite drunk, he passed into a stage of blind fury, snatched up a knife, and rushed at people. The convicts, knowing his terrible strength, ran and hid themselves. He fell upon anyone he met. But they soon found means to get control of him. A dozen men, inmates of the same prison ward as Gazin, would suddenly rush at him all at once and begin beating him. Nothing crueler could be imagined. They beat him on the chest, on the heart, on the pit of the stomach, on the belly. They beat him hard and beat him a long time. They only desisted when he lost consciousness and lay like a corpse. They could not have brought themselves to beat any other convict like that, to beat like that meant killing any other man, but not Gazin. Then they wrapped his unconscious body in a sheepskin and carried it to the bed. 
He'll sleep it off. And he did, in fact, get up next morning, almost uninjured, and went to work, silent and sullen. Every time Gazan got drunk, everyone in the prison knew that the day would certainly end in a beating for him. And he knew this himself, and yet he got drunk. So it went on for several years. At last it was noticed that Gazan was beginning to break up. He began to complain of pains of all sorts, grew noticeably weaker, and was more and more often in the hospital. He is breaking up the convicts said among themselves. He came into the kitchen, followed by the nasty little pole with the fiddle, who was generally hired by the festive convicts to enhance their jollity, and he stood still in the middle of the room, silently and attentively scanning all present. All were silent. At last, seeing me and my companion, he looked at us spitefully and derisively, smiled self-complacently, seemed to think of something, and staggering heavily came towards our table. "'Where did you get the money for this little treat, may I inquire?' he began. He spoke Russian. I exchanged silent glances with my companion, realizing that the best thing was to hold our tongues and not to answer him. At the first contradiction, he would have flown into a fury. "'So you've money, have you?' he went on questioning us. "'So you've a lot of money, eh? And you come to prison to drink tea? You've come to drink tea, have you? Speak, damn you!' But seeing that we had made up our minds to be silent and to take no notice of him, he turned crimson and shook with rage. Near him in the corner stood a big tray which was used for the slices of bread cut for the dinner or supper of the convicts. It was large enough to hold the bread for half the prison. At the moment it was empty. He picked it up with both hands and raised it above us. In another moment he would have smashed our heads. A murder or an attempt at murder threatened the whole prison with extremely unpleasant consequences. It would be followed by inquiries, searches, and greater severity, and so the convicts did their utmost not to let things come to such an extremity. And yet, in spite of that, on this occasion all kept quiet and waited. Not one word in our defense. Not one shout at Gazan, so intense was their hatred of us. They were apparently pleased at our dangerous position. But the incident passed off without harm. Just as he was about to bring down the tray, someone shouted from the passage, Gazin! Vodka's stolen! He let the tray fall crashing on the floor and rushed like mad out of the kitchen. Well, God saved them, the convicts said among themselves. And they repeated it long after. I could not find out afterwards whether the news of the theft of the vodka was true or invented on the spur of the moment to save us. In the evening, after dusk, before the prison was locked up, I walked round the fence and an overwhelming sadness came upon me. I never experienced such sadness again in all my prison life. The first day of confinement, whether it be in prison, in the fortress, or in Siberia, is hard to bear. But I remember what absorbed me more than anything was one thought which haunted me persistently all the time I was in prison. A difficulty that cannot be fully solved. I cannot solve it even now. The inequality of punishment for the same crime... It is true that crimes cannot be compared even approximately. For instance, two men may commit murders. All the circumstances of each case are weighed, and in both cases almost the same punishment is given. Yet look at the difference between the crimes. One may have committed a murder for nothing, for an onion. He murdered a peasant on the high road who turned out to have nothing but an onion. See, father, you sent me to get booty. Here I've murdered a peasant, and all I've found is an onion. 
Fool? An onion means a farthing. A hundred murders and a hundred onions and you've got a ruble. A prison legend. Another murders a sensual tyrant in defense of the honor of his betrothed, his sister, or his child. Another is a fugitive, hemmed in by the regiment of trackers, who commits a murder in defense of his freedom, his life, often dying of hunger. And another murders little children for the pleasure of killing, of feeling their warm blood on his hands, of enjoying their terror, and the last dove-like flutter under the knife. Yet all of these are sent to the same penal servitude. It is true that there are variations in the length of the sentence, but these variations are comparatively few, and the variations in the same sort of crime are infinitely numerous. There are as many shades of difference as there are characters. But let us admit that it is impossible to get over this inequality, that it is in its own way an insoluble problem, like squaring the circle. Apart from this, let us look at another inequality, at the difference in the effect of a punishment. One man will pine, waste away like a candle in prison, while another had no notion till he came to prison that such a jolly existence, such a pleasant club of spirited companions was to be found in the world. Yes, there are some in prison like that. Or take the case of an educated man with an awakened conscience, intelligence, heart. The mere ache of his own heart will kill him by its torments sooner than any punishment. He condemns himself for his crime more unsparingly, more relentlessly than the most rigorous law. And beside him is another who has never once all the time he has been in prison thought of the murder he has committed. He positively considers he has done right. And there are men who commit crimes on purpose to be sent to penal servitude, in order to escape from a far more penal life of labor outside. There he lived in the deepest degradation, never had enough to eat, and worked from morning to night for his exploiter. In prison the work is lighter than at home. There is bread in plenty and of better quality than he has ever seen before, and on holidays there is beef. Then there are alms and there is a chance of earning something. And the company? It consists of shrewd, crafty fellows who know everything, and he looks on his companions with respectful astonishment. He has never seen anyone like them before. He looks upon them as the very highest society in the world. Is the punishment equally felt in these two cases? But why trouble oneself with unanswerable questions? The drum beats. It is time to be back in our wards. Breaking in. The old believers were a religious group who split with the Russian Orthodox Church in the 17th century over its inclusion of Greek Orthodox practices in its rituals. They afterwards suffered persecution from the mainstream church. The fact that an honest, mild-mannered member from this group should feel compelled to burn down an Orthodox church for his faith is a testament to how deeply the convictions could run within the sect. The group is sometimes referred to as the Raskolniki, which means schismatics. That name might perk up the ears of those who have read Crime and Punishment. The protagonist of that novel similarly has a name that derives from the Russian word for schism. The figure of Sorotkin requires special mention. You might remember that the young man had no trade, but usually had some money. Where did that money come from? And why is he receiving new clothes as gifts? What are these taunts that are often sent his way? I mentioned at the end of the last chapter that Dostoevsky never explicitly mentions male prostitution, but his description of Srotkin here very subtly insinuates it. Sorotkin's story also includes a feature that will come up again in later chapters. 
Well, soldiering offered a promising career opportunity for young officers. For the peasant class, it was often not much better than a prison sentence. And from Sorotkin's perspective, was worse. His decision, combined with some comments our narrator offers at the end of this chapter, helped to explain the censor's concern that Dostoevsky's book might encourage crime. The state would not want others following Sorotkin's example. We hear in this chapter that Goryanchikov encountered a notorious criminal at Tobolsk. As noted in my introductory comments, Tobolsk was a stopping point on the road from European Russia to the prison camp and served as a sort of way station for these prison convoys. Dostoevsky will make frequent reference to this place in the pages ahead. We hear that Gazin was a Tatar. The Tatars were an ethnic group related to the Turks who lived in the south of Russia. Gazin is thus representing one of very many different ethnic groups in the camp. End of comments.